Sports crowd. Look at you. You're the best people. Rainy, nasty Sunday. You're going straight to heaven. Okay, I just I don't have any. I just thought I'd say that. Second Kings chapter two verses nine through fifteen. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, "Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken from you." Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Uh, I think there's more. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel, and Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of the garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. The Bible says they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Let me make this statement very clear today, men and women. The anointing of the Holy Spirit demands respect. It demands it. The man or the woman that carries it does not demand it, but the anointing itself demands a response and a respect. When T.D. Jakes walks on the stage, people aren't applauding because he's good looking. They're applauding because of the anointing of the Holy Ghost on his life. This is Pentecost Sunday, and I want to emphasize a double portion of the Holy Spirit today. We're in our understudy series, part seven, and today the message is entitled, Elijah and Elisha, the Double Portion Mentor. The double portion mentor. Now, I don't know if most of you have ever considered this before. Elisha asked Elijah for a double portion of Elijah's anointing. I don't know if some of you have ever looked at the actual numbers of what that turned out to be. So please look at your notes with me, and we're going to bring them up on the screen as well. Quickly. Page one, we're going to look at Elijah's miracles, uh, the first session. There's the first seven. They'll come up in lots of seven. Elijah's miracles, part one. You'll see them there. Now look at the second grouping of Elijah's miracles, part two. There's a second section. That goes from number eight to number 14. There are a total of 14 miracles that Elijah performed in his ministry. Now let's look at Elisha's miracles part one. You see there in lots of seven. There's one to seven. Put the second one up if you would. You'll see the second part, number eight through number 14. All of them, you've read the stories. Many of you have before in the word of God uh, of these miracles taking place. Part three in Elisha's life, prophecy of the Syrian battle plans all the way down to part 21, deception of the Syrians with the sounds of chariots. And the last portion of Elisha miracles, 22 through 28. You need to see there that there are actually double the miracles in Elisha's life as there were in Elijah's life. Not close to it, but actual double. Now, we see here that Elijah ruled as prophet under the evil rulership of Ahab and his witch doctor wife Jezebel. He served for 24 years 
as the prophet of Israel. About 14 years into his ministry, young Elisha, the understudy, joined him as an understudy. Now, Elisha indeed had seen and heard of Elijah's previous miracles, but then when Elijah is taken up to heaven on a fiery chariot, Elisha asked him for a double portion of his miracles to come on his life. And to be honest with you, friends, an actual double portion came on his life. We see that Elisha begins to operate in miracle working power. And over a 60 year period of time in which he led the school of the prophets in Israel under uh, this wicked king and other wicked kings, he performed 27 miracles and then he died. Okay, are you there? Are you listening? Listen carefully. He performs 27 miracles and dies. They lay him in a tomb. And after that time, for some years, Moabite warriors and attackers perpetually came into Israel, troubling Israel. On one such occasion, these Moabite troublers came into Israel and a group of young Israelis were burying a dead friend of theirs. This friend of theirs had passed away. And they were in the process of digging a hole to bury him. But as these Moabite troublers came in, they knew that there's no time to bury the man. So the Bible says in 2 Kings 13, 21, that they rolled the stone away from Elijah's tomb and threw the dead body onto Elijah, Elijah's dead bones. Elisha's dead bones. The Bible says that when this dead man's body hit Elisha's dead bones, immediately the man came back to life and was resurrected from the dead, causing in his death the 28th miracle, which is called the double portion mentor anointing miracle of God on his life. Can you say amen? <laughs> so the question is, what was it that this man Elijah taught and exemplified in the life of Elisha that caused Elisha to be able to do twice the work that his mentor Elijah did? Now remember that it was always God's will. Jesus always has wanted the next generation to be more powerful than the previous generation. Remember, he said when he left, John chapter 14, verse 12, Verily, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. So I've start, I'm not going to take my miracles with me, Jesus said. I'm going to leave you with the power of the Holy Ghost. It's going to be a double portion anointing. It's going to be a latter rain. Joel said in chapter 2, he said, In the last days, saith the Lord, I'll pour up my spirit upon all flesh. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. He said, I'm going to pour this second anointing, this double portion on you. And sure enough, on the day of Pentecost, it happened. We're on that day today. There is power in this room today. Get ready for the power of the Holy Ghost to meet you right where you are. But what was it that this older man taught the younger man? Number one, I believe the double portion mentor teaches the understudy to be bold. To be bold. I really believe that. I believe that boldness is necessary in the work of God. 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1. The Bible says, now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now the Bible says that Elijah from Tishbe was a hairy man. This was before hair removal, laser hair removal was not yet in fashion. This was way before GQ. And besides that, he was from Tishbe. Tishbe, you might as well have been raised in the sticks. I mean, if you're in Florida, you'd be in Pahokee. 
I'm just telling you, this place was the sticks. Tishbe was. And he arrives with no fanfare. No one's ever heard of him. He has no lineage. The Bible mentions no lineage, which is huge for Judaism. Judaism was all about a man's or woman's ancestry. Always mentioned in the Bible. But here is a man with no background, no lineage. He arrives from Tishbe, and he's no cool warrior whatsoever. He's just bold. He's so bold that he gets an audience with King Hab, Ahab, the witch doctor, and he says to him, it's not going to rain until I say it rains. Now, friends, you got to know that Ahab had turned his back on the God of Israel, was now serving Baal wholeheartedly, and he was married to the witch of all witches, Queen Jezebel. How many have ever heard of the Jezebel spirit mentioned? Ever hear that? That is a term that we use in modern times to typify a person who must control the situation. A controlling spirit. You, I, I got to run this thing. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm on, I'm on uh, uh, controlling. It's the Jezebel spirit. And that's what this woman had. Her husband was the most henpecked human on planet Earth. He couldn't even go to the bathroom without checking in. I'm telling you, this woman was a witch. And he had married her, embraced the, the service of Baal. Baal was the storm god. Baal was the one that these people prayed to to make it rain. Are you with me? This... <laughs> This Tishbite from Tishbe with a leather belt on, a hairy man with no GQ experience, says it won't rain until I say it's going to rain. He was a man of Jehovah, Yahweh. He was a man of God. He didn't give a rip what anybody thought. He was there to re represent God and God alone. He didn't care what those people thought about their God or their mission or their political agenda. He was there to call it what it is. God's in place now. I don't care who you serve. God's in charge. Huh. Let me say something to you today, church. God has always worked through men and women who have a spirit of boldness who are not afraid to be bold. You see, timidity is not attractive. If you want to attract people to Jesus Christ, don't be some timid soul over in the corner, all scared and sour puss, and I don't think it's going to work. I'm tired of I don't think it's going to work. I believe it's going to work. Jesus has called us here to see it happen. Paul said in 2 Timothy 7, verse 1 and chap, chap, chapter 1 and verse 7, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And those are the three qualities that Jesus possessed when he was walking on this earth. He possessed power, love, and self-discipline. The same kind of qualities that St. Peter had when he looked into the face of that man known as Simon the Sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 and said, Thy money perish with thee for thinking you could purchase the power of God. The same kind of power that St. Paul had when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. The same kind of power that he exhibited when he said in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Hallelujah. And of course, even in prayer, friends, God has called us to approach the throne of grace with boldness. The writer of Hebrews says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence or power so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is what our noon prayer meetings on Wednesday are all about. I'm telling you, we've got a bold group of people that show up every Wednesday at noon. About 100 folks show up every Wednesday at noon. And we don't come in to crawl over into a corner somewhere and read social media for an hour. No. No. You know all those words that people want to th throw in front of it. No. No. That's not what we do. We come in with boldness. 
Yes, we confess our sins. Yes, we repent at this altar. Yes, we plead for God for mercy. Yes, we believe for His grace. But then we get mad at the devil. And we start up and down these aisles and up and down these roads. Nobody's sitting. We're all walking. We're marching. And we're praying out loud. And we're touch I touched every chair in this room this past Wednesday. I prayed that God would fill every chair with a person and every person with the Holy Ghost on Pentecost Sunday. We're bold men and women of God. And friends, I'm going to tell you something. There's going to take a boldness from God's men and women to stand in the face of the devil in these last days and say, enough is enough. You've taken too much. It's over for you, devil. We move forward in the power of God's might. He taught Elisha to be bold. Secondly, I believe with all my heart, the double portion mentor teaches the understudy to trust God Completely. I mean completely. To trust him completely. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, I must tell you, friends, that people have a tendency to serve Jesus and serve something else too. I got Jesus, but thank God for what I got in the bank. Oh, hallelujah for what I got. And they're more happy about what they've got in the bank than they are about Jesus. The Bible says in 1 Kings 17, verses 2 through 9, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and the, then the, he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up, and it always will, because God doesn't want you trusting the brook. He wants you trusting Jesus. Hallelujah. Because there had been no rain in the land. Why hadn't there been any rain? The man who had a brook dried up on him had said there's not going to be any rain. So now he's facing his own personal prophecy. Then the word of the Lord came. To him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Now, I think this is amazing, friends, because even though we know nothing about Elijah's background, he comes on the scene, he makes these bold predictions, he hears from God, he obeys God, and then... When he does what God's told him to do, God says, I want you to get out of here. You need to hide out for a while, get in the Kareth Ravine. And by the way, I have prepared the ravens. I've talked to the ravens. I've talked to the birds. And they're going to supply you with bread and meat uh, in the morning and at night as well. What is that? What is that? You talk to the birds? Do you not think that God could have supplied this man of God with you know, T-bone steaks, medium, rare, cut the way I like them. And big jugs of plastic purified, plastic contained purified water, even before plastic was created. Do you not think that God could have done that for his great man, Elijah? Yes! But God is just God. I was going to do all that, and then I decided to talk to the birds. Because, you know, they listen to whatever I say. And they're going to bring you some bread. Now, ravens are scavengers. Where'd they get that meat? Where'd they get that bread? Anyway, let's forget, forget about that. I, I don't even know why. I, I, no, I didn't bring that up. It was perfect meat and perfect bread. And, and, he, and then finally the brook dries up. And God goes, no worries. I got you. I have got this widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, and she's going to take care of you. I, I've already talked to her. She's got it. Now, folks, I just saw the movie Founder, and that, that's a story of Ray Kroc and how he built the McDonald's franchises worldwide. He died a multi-billionaire, and when he died, his young wife, she's like 35 years younger than him. He's been married 100 times. He couldn't get anyone else to marry him. He was so old when he finally died. But when he finally died, his young wife gave all his money away. She did what he would have never done. 
She gave a billion dollars to Salvation Army. Are you? I, I, hello? The biggest donors in America right now are widows. Because their rich husband made all the money and never gave a dime. Then he dies. The widow gets it. And she's so guilty, she gives everything away before she dies. And you figured he must have picked a rich widow in Zerubbabel. Not. Unfortunately, this widow in Zarephath is getting ready to eat her last meal with her son. And she's, and he shows up. Elijah shows up and says, you know, I need something. Can you feed me something to eat? And she goes, you know, I'm just getting ready to cook this last meal of bread. And my son and I are going to eat it. And then we're going to die because this is all we've got. But, okay, you can have it. Now, when she gives him that last meal of bread, the Bible says that God supplied her every need from that point on the rest of her life. Here is a man who has just spoken to the president and the president has had to sit down after the prophet has talked to him and that God has the prophet go and live by a brook and have ravens feed him. And then when the brook dries up, he has this man of God go to this poor widowed woman and eat off of her table. I'm telling you something, folks. You think that God's going to take care of his men and women better than that, but the truth is God wants us totally dependent. I've known millionaires that are totally dependent on God. I know paupers that are totally dependent on God. The issue is who are you dependent on? Are you willing to be totally committed and dependent to God? Stories told of C.T. Studd. He was born in 1860 in England. He died in 1931 in Africa. C.T. Studd was born to a very wealthy, wealthy family in England. So wealthy. Graduated from high school, he went to Cambridge University. He was a cricketer, probably the greatest cricketer in England at the time. After graduation from Cambridge, he became the leading cricketer of all of England. He could jam any stadium in England if C.T. Studd and his team were playing. He was the Michael Jordan of cricket. So he doesn't just have his inheritance, he now has thousands of pounds coming in every month because he's the greatest athlete in England. He is a ladies' man, party man. I'm telling you, wild parties. On one such occasion, Charles Spurgeon invited his friend D.L. Moody from America, Chicago, to come to London, England and preach the gospel in the big stadium where C.T. Studd jammed stadiums playing cricket. And night after night, D.L. Moody, the great preacher, would fill that stadium in London, England with thousands and thousands of people, people coming to faith in Christ night after night. And finally, C.T. Studd heard about the preacher from America that could fill the stadium that he, the cricket player, could fill. He said, I'm going to go hear him. He thought he was going to provide some kind of a standoff to the man of God. <laughs> Good luck. He gets there and he was so convicted of his sin that at the altar call he went running to the altar and accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. He continued to play cricket for a year. He was miserable while he was playing cricket. He had such a call of God on his life that finally, after a year, he said, I can't do this anymore. I must preach the gospel. And after leading hundreds of young people to the Lord all out throughout England, he felt called to go as a missionary to the China, China Inland Mission. He met, after a year or so, a young lady who was from that mission in China. They fell in love. And his parents were so opposed to him leaving England to go to China as a missionary. But as he was getting ready to leave, his father passed away. And in that passing, handed off to C.T. Studd, one 100,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds in 1880 and 1890 was valued at 20 million U.S. dollars today in which we live this year. He looked at his bride-to-be. They were getting ready to be married and then sail for China. He said, sweetheart, what should we do with this money? Should we keep part of it? 
and give part of it. Should we give a little, keep a lot, keep a little, give a lot? She said, CT, give it all. Give it all away to God's work. That way we can stay totally committed to Jesus Christ and trust him fully. And so C.T. and his bride gave it all away around the world. And they sailed for China, penniless. And God never failed them. For years in China, then years in India, they built hundreds of churches, preached the gospel, would come home to England on furlough. Hundreds of young English men and women would be called to preach the gospel after salvation. And they started going around the world as missionaries. And finally at 51, C.T. Studd was called home because he was so sick. His doctor said, your lungs are so congested and so sick that you will die if you remain anywhere but here in England. And for a couple years, he struggled at home in England. He was miserable. And then he read the, the writings of David Livingston. And he became so enthralled with the nation of Africa, the continent of Africa, that he said to his wife, we must go to Africa. So be it if I die. So be it if I die there. I must go to Africa and work for Jesus. And so he and his wife went to Africa and friends 20 more years he preached the gospel through the Congo, establishing hundreds of churches and died there a man of God fully trusting in Jesus Christ. Jesus never failed him. Thousands came to faith in Christ because of the famous cricket player from England. David Livingston made a quote that C.T. Studd preached in almost every major message he preached after getting to Africa. He said, I'd rather be in Africa in God's will than sit on the throne of England out of God's will. My friend today, I'm not asking you to give every last dollar to God. I'm asking you today to get in line with God's will and realize that only when we're fully dependent on God is our life at the height of fulfillment that God has called us to. If you believe it, say amen. amen. The Bible says in Psalms 84, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold. Hold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. King David said, I want to trust God. And last of all, this afternoon, men and women, I believe the double portion mentor teaches the understudy how to stand alone. How to stand alone. This is a very very challenging point I make and close with. Those of you who would be men and women of God will come to a place in your life, in time, if you haven't already, and many of you have, where there'll be that occasion where you're the only one standing for righteousness' sake. And the question in that moment, in that hour, what will you do? Are you so full of faith are you so full of the Holy Ghost that even in the darkest hour, you will not bend, you will not yield to the enemy's temptation, but you will stand alone for the cause of Christ. Finally, there came a point where Baal worship had so overwhelmed the nation. They were broke, they were hungry, they were thirsty. And God says it's time. And so Elijah heads to Mount Carmel. He calls the king and everyone in Israel that could hear. And the prophets of Baal and Asherah together at Mount Carmel. The Bible says in 1 Kings, Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. He wasn't the only believer left. Later on, we find out there's 7,000 in Israel that had not bowed and needed him. But he was the only prophet of God left in all of Israel. Have you ever been in that situation before? You're the only one. You're the only one standing for righteousness. There's an opportunity for this big deal to happen, but it isn't the will of God. You know it, and you're the only one in the group, and you've got to take a stand or you've got to yield. What are you going to do? I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. 
another 400 of Asherah. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. So the plan is, we're going to get two bulls. We're going to cut them up, put them on an altar. You pray to your God. I'll pray to my God. Whichever God answers by fire, that'll be the God we serve. And the people all said, sounds good. You see, there comes a point where society itself is just tired of all the promises, of all the bull. They, had, they knew they had turned their backs on God. They knew this was a man of God. And it took this man of God by himself, standing alone, to say, here's what we're going to do. And when they heard it, they said, sounds good to us. Sounds good. Let's go. Let's go. The Bible says that all day long, these witch doctors were crying out to their dead God who couldn't hear for fire. Nothing happened. He's got, they got sticks. They're beating themselves. They're cutting their backs with knives. And the Bible says the whole time they're doing this, the man of God, Elijah, the hairy man with a leather belt from Pahokee is making fun of them. He's not just standing quietly. He's making fun of their God. Finally, by the end of the day, he says, enough's enough. My turn. I've given you a whole blooming day. All right? About, time, what, about what time do you think he's going to show? Because I don't have any more. My turn. And they all stood down. And he started to pray. And friends, all of a sudden, the Bible says that fire started falling out of heaven and consumed the sacrifice. The fire was so intense, it burned the rocks to ash. I'm going to make a statement here. When you're the only one in a large group who stands for righteousness, a double portion of faith will immerse you in the grace of God every time. I promise you. I promise you. And friends, I am ta I'm telling you as your pastor, I'm speaking today. I'm not, I'm not speaking pridefully. I'm not speaking arrogantly. I'm telling you I'm speaking from experience. It's happened so many times. I've walked into a situation. I'm the only one. And some of you are shaking your heads because you've been there too. You've experienced it yourself. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I've walked into a situation and it's really bad and I'm scared. I'm all by myself and I know that I got to take a stand and then as I begin to pray on the inside, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the double portion of God's fire begins to fall on my head and on my shoulder. And all of a sudden, a peace overflows me. And I begin to feel like I'm a conductor of a symphony of trouble that I conduct right out of the room by the power of the Holy Ghost. He will be with you if you're willing to stand alone for him. In your darkest hours. Shortly thereafter, this great man of God from Tishbe, with a leather belt and a hairy body, and no GQ experience, comes knocking on Elisha, the young, wealthy businessman's door. History tells us he was part of a large farming industry that he owned. Comes calling. God's calling you, son. You're the one. You're the one. The Bible says, he said, give me a minute to have a party. The Bible says he broke apart all 12 of his plows, which were his business machineries. Broke all of his plows and made the biggest bonfire they'd ever seen in that part of the world at that time. Cut all 24 of his oxen up, slaughtered them, and had the biggest giant business party barbecue to say I'm out and as he headed out he headed out victoriously totally dependent on God totally willing to stand alone with the man of God he never looked back and one day they're standing 
on this side of the Jordan, the school of the prophets are behind Elijah and Elisha. And Elisha speaks to that Jordan River and it splits. And they walk across on dry ground. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Whoo. Hallelujah. God, do it again. Do it again, Jesus. Hallelujah. The Jordan River split. The Bible says the two of them walked across on dry ground to the other side. School of the prophets stayed on this side. All of a sudden, this fiery chariot with fiery horses descends from heaven. The man of God jumps on. And that chariot takes Elijah alive to heaven. And he drops his cloak on the way out. The Bible says the young man walks over and picks up his mentor's cloak. He's not afraid. He turns around and there's a fire in his soul. He raises that cloak over his head and he, he brings it down on that Jordan River and smacks it. He says, where is the God of Elijah? And that river split in two. And he walked towards the school of the prophets. And those prophets looked at each other and said, we've got our man. The spirit of Elijah is on him. They didn't know a double portion of the spirit of Elijah was on them. They would find out over 60 years of traveling with him. And 28 miracles later, that's called the double portion anointing from a double portion mentor. I want you to bow your head.